Good evening and welcome to Proctors and welcome to this primary candidates forum. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here. My name is Miles Reed and I'm the editor at the Gazette and I'm going to be moderating tonight. Just wanted to start first by you know thanking all of the candidates for joining us tonight. I know people are busy. I know lives are getting back to normal after the pandemic or we're still winding down and it's and we're all I think busier than ever before. Uh, I don't know about the group, but for myself, uh, this is an odd feeling to be out in public uh, with a tie on. It's not something I've done a whole lot this past year. Um, I got a good feeling about tonight's event this morning when I was out walking with my wife, and I said, you know what, I realize I don't know if my dress pants are going to fit after a year of uh, the pandemic. And the good news is we got by by, by just a little bit, so uh, I think it's going to be a positive night. So I want to start also, in addition to thanking the candidates for joining us, I want to thank uh, the organizers and sponsors of this event. Uh, it, one of the main organizers is a uh, gentleman to my left, Tom Carey with Schenectady United Neighborhoods. Thanks for all the good work putting this together, Tom. Also I want to uh, thank the Schenectady NAACP for their efforts to put this together. Um, the questions that we have here for you are questions that were curated by both organizations and they put them together and it was a, it was a combined uh, effort to get some questions that represent the issues that these organizations think are important in this year's primary and in this year's city council race. So before we go on too much farther, I just wanna remind people, especially uh, for people who are tuning in from home the primary election this year will be June 22nd. That's coming up in a few weeks. Before that, early voting this year, and, and early voting is one of these new things that some people don't even realize we have in New York State, but early voting starts June 12th, which is uh, this coming Saturday, and then people will be able to do early voting all the way up until June 20th, which is the Sunday before the primary day. Uh, so those are some important dates. And then on primary day, of course, we will have these races. I'll break it down for, for viewers again so there's clarity. This is a little bit one of these unusual years in that we have some uh, vacant terms, we've got some regular terms, and we've also got some county legislature. So at, on the, the ballot this year for the primary, there will be three total open seats for the full term vacancies on the Schenectady City Council. And for those seats, we have four candidates. We've got to my right here and going uh, on here, we've got Karen Zaluski Wildzunis. We have John Mutu Varen. We have Marion Porterfield, who's an incumbent on the council. And we have, uh, and so is Karen, I apologize. And we also have uh, Damani Farley. The other seats that are open, there are uh, two year vacancy seats by uh, seats that were opened up by council candidates who have left for one reason or another. There are two of these seats and there are three candidates. Again, on our, my right and moving on, we've got Doreen DeToro, we've got Hylib Samuel to her right, and we've got Carl Williams at the end there. So welcome to everyone. Um, in the second portion of this, we'll introduce the county legislature candidates, but for now, what I wanna do is I'm gonna turn it over to our candidates and we're gonna start to my right here each candidate will have two minutes to do their introduction and tell the voters who they are. And then when we're done with all of the introductions, and I'll cue everybody as we go along the line, and then after that, we'll jump right into the questions. So Karen, would you like to begin? Sure, thank you. My name is Karen Zaluski, will join us. I wanna thank you for the invitation to participate in the forum this evening. I do need to leave at 7.30, and I wanna apologize up front if I do need to depart before the completion of the forum. I have a background in banking and real estate. I was a commercial lender and team leader for KeyBank for over 25 years, and I am currently a commercial real estate broker with Berkshire Hathaway Blake Realtors. I have a unique background which ad, I believe adds value to the city council position. Being a banking, banker has given me experience in lending money to businesses, not-for-profits, and municipalities. This knowledge has assisted me in analyzing the city's financial statements. While at Key, I was instrumental in helping the minority and women-owned businesses obtaining the MWBE certification. In selling and presenting real estate, I have a professional understanding of real estate market that I bring to the table when we are selling city-owned property. 
During my tenure on the council, we've sold over $5 million in city-owned properties. I've lived in the city for, almost, for over 30 years. My children went to the city schools, and I have and continue to be involved in many not-for-profits that support and serve the city, such as MySci, Capital Region Chamber, Northern Rivers, just to name a few. I'm looking forward to serving the people of Schenectady for another four years. We will continue to move, the for move forward in a very fiscally responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Porterfield? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marion Porterfield, and I'm currently on the City Council running for another four-year term. I've been on the Council since 2012, and I'd just like to tell you what brought me to the Council. Before actually getting on the City Council, I spent a lot of time coming to the Council meetings as a community representative, presenting uh, what the community would like to see. From my perspective, there was not enough of a community voice on the council, which is why I chose to run. And I feel that at, at being on the council, I've been able to bring that, inf that to the council. I am a longtime Schenectady resident, attended schools here. Um, my family here is here as well. And I feel like what the strengths, some of the strengths that I bring to the council are that I listen, continue to listen to the community, to hear what they have to say and to bring that information to the table. Additionally, I feel that um, so having a difference of opinion sometimes and expressing a, an opinion maybe that is not the, the same as everyone else, it's helpful because you get to see the things from all angles. And also, staying in touch with the voters is extremely in, important to me, not just during election year, but all the time. Because otherwise, how are we able to bring to the table what the community wants to see? I strongly believe in participatory government because the taxpayer money is taxpayer money, and they should have a voice in how to say that and how to spend that money. And additionally, it's not one, you cannot, as one individual, make decisions on the council. So it's important to me that we work collaboratively, that everyone give their ideas, say what they have to say, and then we come to a decision collectively for the best for the council. And that is, in my opinion, is the only way that we can completely and fairly govern for our community. I also think that it's important that we have a diversity of ideas, of individuals, of talents and skills that are brought to this table. Thank you very much, Mr. Mutuvarin. Thank you, good evening everyone. I would like to thank the NAACP and SON organization for inviting us to this forum. I do look forward for this forum to hear our message to the voter. My name is John Mutuvira and I'm currently the Schenectady City Council President. And this year marked my eight years serving on the council. For over the eight years, I have worked and assisted with uh, many successful project, projects that benefit our residents. Want to mention the neighborhood revitalization with the annual permit fee. Last year, we were able to give back over $35,000 to our residents who have pulled permits to do exterior works. I was instrumental in working with my colleagues, both city and county, to provide a waiver of interest and penalty on property taxes during the COVID period, and we still have that program going on currently. Many homeowners are affected by this COVID pandemic and need all the help city government can provide. I was instrumental in working with our affirmative action officer to amend the MWBE laws to equip this office with the tools needed to make sure our contractors and hiring are in compliance with today's MWBE policies. We also adapted the federally Section 3 policy so that employment can be provided to local residents around the project site in Schenectady. I have worked with our county health department to bring COVID resource, including masks and vaccine, to the underserved community and will continue this outreach I am a big believer in financial discipline and transparency. In the last budget, I was able to convince some of my colleagues to avoid the 17.5 laid off and save many services from the proposed 2021 budget. I was able to find funding source for these cuts and I'm happy that we did that because today we're seeing the benefit by doing that to save jobs and services. Thank I'm you. also a big believer that we provide our children and family and youth today to give the basic resource needed to fulfill the, their dream. My Thank mission you, is Mr. to continue Mutuver, to work so. and adapt these Thank as you. we move forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Farley, you're next. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Damani Farley, I am, you know, I was born and raised here in Schenectady. 
Um, I, I'm a small business owner here in Schenectady, and I also am a husband and a father here in Schenectady. Um, so to me, um, this is personal. Um, it's very important to me, the reason why I'm running is because it's important to me that we have a thriving, robust community that provides uh, opportunity and access for all that live here. Um, you know, among the uh, various capacities I work in the community and as a, a board of, one of the trustees at the board of Schenectady County Community College, um, our Schenectady Youth Call to Action uh, movement, our Bridge to Cap initiative that is held right here in Proctor's, um, where we, has been our response to the pandemic and how it impacted our students in Schenectady City School District. Um, and all of those things are important, but I think what's most important and what I think that voters really want to understand is that I'm somebody who believes in making decisions with people and not for people. Um, and I think that as we talk about all of the good things that are happening in our city, especially when we talk about things like some of the economic growth, if it has not changed or improved the material conditions of the people who actually live here, if you can't feel that, if you don't, if it's not tangible for you, then it's missing the mark and we're missing the mark. And it will make really good for a campaign flyer. It'll be a great photo op to stand in front of new construction. But if that construction isn't employing people that live here and hopefully um, housing people that live here for a long period of time and where they can take root and have a thriving life with the family here and they can contribute not to only our economy but the culture, the soul of our city, then to say the least, we're missing the mark. Thank you, Mr. Farley. So now we'll move to the three candidates uh, for the two-year vacancy terms. Uh, there are two seats available. We'll start with Doreen DeToro. Hello and good evening. My name is Doreen DeToro, and I would like to thank the members of the NAACP and SUN for taking the time to organize this forum. I think it's imperative that the residents of the city of Schenectady are aware of my stance and agenda on city issues so they are able to make an informed decision in this democratic primary. I have lived in the city of Schenectady for the past 36 years and involved myself in many community and neighborhood outreach programs. I currently remain active and volunteer in many of these religious and community organizations. For the past 25 years, I have owned and operated Rossi and DeToro Funeral Home, a 114-year-old establishment located in the city's historic Union Corridor. I have developed long-lasting relationships with thousands of individuals, residents, clergy persons, and business professionals. I continue to work in this capacity serving families who have entrusted me with their most treasured loved ones. It was instilled in me at a very young age by my immigrant parents that through adversity comes triumph. This is a belief I continue to live by, I have instilled in my daughters, and how I intend to work for you on the Schenectady City Council moving our city forward with positivity and growth. I will, work, I will make an honest and earnest effort to work for the residents who are so faithfully placing their trust in me. I will work towards improved quality of life issues. I will support the enforcement of noise ordinances, speeding, traffic, and, and laws. This can only be achieved, I feel, by fully staffing our law enforcement agencies. I will continue to work for the already fast-moving neighborhood revitalizations taking place, and I will invest in rec recreational advances for our youth and our seniors. I promise to serve the residents of our city with hard work, integrity, and compassion. Thank you so much for this opportunity tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Samuel, you're next. Good evening. My name is Hylop Samuel. I'm a 16-year resident of Schenectady, Schenectady and a business owner. I bring 17 years of executive leadership experience working for large corporations like General Electric and Xerox Corporation. While at Xerox Corporation, I ran a team of 150 people across, th across three shifts, 365 days a year. When we started the operation, we were running at $30 million a year, and we drove that to $100 million a year by the time I left. Then I moved over to GE, where I managed the, the global application portfolio for all of the Global Research Center. Both of those roles required high-level budgetary responsibility and the ability to collaborate with high-level folks um, and some tough issues. My current business is SQ. It's a Schenectady-based business where I employ 30 people. Our primary business is that we focus on operations with local governments, state governments, 
and county governments. And one of the things that's come out of that experience is the understanding of how op uh, governments operate on an operational basis when it comes to land management, licensing, permitting, co code enforcement, and environmental health. And all of the roles, you know, with the budgetary responsibility and the fiscal responsibility and the ability to work with people, I believe those skills I can bring to the city council and help move the city forward with all the agendas that the city and the, city, the mayor and the city council have been doing up to date. Again, another reason I'm doing this is because I have a passion for the city. It's been very good to me over the past 16 years, and I want to be a servant to the city and continue the service that I've been doing. I've been sitting on the housing authority for the past six years, and that's been something that's been near and dear to my heart. And I just want to continue to move forward with everything that I can bring to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. Uh, Mr. C Williams. Good evening, everyone here in attendance uh, in person tonight and everyone viewing uh, at their homes. I'd like to first and foremost thank the Schenectady United Neighborhoods Association and the Schenectady NAACP for organizing, organizing this event. But most importantly, I'd like to thank Proctors for having the AC on because it was extremely hot today. <laughs> and I know everyone has experienced some part of that today. Uh, just to repeat, my name is Carl Williams and I am running for the Schenectady, I'm running in the Schenectady City Special Election uh, along with uh, Hyleb Samuel and Doreen DeToro. I am the eldest of six and grew up in a no-nonsense household. Um, my mom, for all sense and purposes, was a single parent, and we grew up with the expectation that regardless of where we were, we needed to strive harder to get to where we wanted to be. I continued that mantra on to enlisting in the New York Air National Guard, where I currently serve as a first lieutenant as a health services administrator. I recently completed my MBA, which I received from Clarkson University, uh, positioned over in uh, the central or Capital Region campus where I'll be receiving my diploma at graduation this weekend here in Proctors, which I'm really excited for. Uh, but then also I recently accepted a position at Albany Medical College as a practice coordinator where I oversee the practices of a general pediatric department. I love the city of Schenectady. I'm currently here right now because of the influences of a lot of mentors and friends and peers that have decided to invest their time and resource into me personally. Uh, I understand that there are a lot of peers who have not afforded those same benefits, and that's primarily the reason why I'm here, to open up doors and bridge gaps between the individuals that currently serve on our city council to ensure that their lessons learned are not lost and that the individuals that are responsible for continuing on their efforts, the next generation of civic leaders, are well prepared and apt to continue Schenectady down its bright, bright and beneficial uh, future. Again, this city is near and dear to my heart, and one of my statements that I've constantly shouted throughout this entire policy, throughout this entire political journey, is that together we are Schenectady, and only together will we continue striving to be better. Thank you very much. So we're going to jump right now into the questions uh, portion of this. What we're going to do is I'll start off uh, to my right, who will field the question first, and then we'll go through the line. Everybody will eventually have a chance to answer first, so we'll just rotate, and I'll make it clear to you because we'll go along and I'll give you cues. So with question number one, I'll just ask it once in case you want to take notes, uh, it might be advised. Some of these questions are, you know, a little bit multifaceted. Um, so I'm going to ask it once. I'm happy to repeat it if need be, but obviously we want to keep moving. So question number one, do you support further police reform such as the elimination of the use of force methods like the use of a knee or weight to control suspects? and also the training of officers to conduct their work without the use of ethnic profiling. Would you advocate for, more, for a more diverse community policing workforce that includes the use of social workers to diffuse community disturbances? Candidate Zalewski, I'm so used to calling you ZW, so okay, I'm sorry. That's, fine. that's a, a mouthful. So, um, so uh, we just completed our um, our collaboration in re reforming the police department. And um, I believe that it's, it, it was a good document that was sent to the governor. Um, I believe that um, it, it is a living, breathing document and that we will continue to have community conversations, that we will continue to have more training, that we will advocate for um, mental health specialists and that um, the training is going to be critical to ensure that, you know, what the leadership within the police department wants to get accomplished. Um, I believe that uh, use of force is necessary in certain instances, and I believe the training necessary um, for use of force has changed, 
and I believe that uh, Chief Clifford, under his leadership, has led the department into a much better state of um, mind in reference to using their force. Um, and I don't remember the last the social. Was. Yeah, the, the question was, would you would you advocate for a more diverse community policing workforce that includes the use of social workers to diffuse yes, yes, uh, disturbances? Yes. So, and I'm out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ms. Porterfield. Not much. Thank you. So in terms of use of force, um, we did have a comprehensive document. We'd spent a lot of time going through that document. Uh, one of the things that was in 2020, uh, a situation happened here in Schenectady. And at that time, there was a press conference where the mayor, the then um, commissioner of public safety, and the police department chief said that we would no longer have knee holes so that I strongly supported and still support and think that we should not do that um, but that I understand that people have to be with uh, restrained however I feel a knee to a vital part of your body is not could 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 end up in a very poor outcome so I do not support knee holes to ne necks and heads I do not I definitely know that we need um, more training and will and, and have training right now, but we need additional training so that if, a, if police officers are trained in a specific way, let's talk about knee holes, and that has changed, then we need to retrain so that they, are, they leave the situation safe, safely as well. So that's extremely important. In terms of community policing, I think it's very necessary. And yes, um, I do feel that we need to more diversity on our police force. And in addition to that, we could also, in terms of community policing, include uh, residents who can interact with people who we are, we're a very diverse community ethnically. So to have a group of individuals who can help the police, since our, if our police force don't have the diversity that it needs currently, that could help our police to engage with that community. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Matuvern. Thank you. Our police department has come a long way. And one of my recommendations um, during the task force and, and reinvention um, um, outreach was regards to diversifying the police department, and I think I uh, was tasked by Mr. Ron Gardner to come up with a plan how we can diversify the police department, and that is in the task force that was presented to the governor. In terms of the recommendation, uh, you know, it's a document that we intend to revisit. It's not something that is done and written in stone. So the police department is functioning in a capacity there right now with the task force and the recommendation. We encourage the police department, city official, and community leader to continue to work together so that we can able to reform and to address the many concerns that is happening out there. In terms of community policing, that's one of the recommendations also in the task force is that we looked at funding community policing outreach and look at mental health and funding program to assist the police department when they are in crisis or situation like with mental health issue. Thank you, uh, Mr. Farley. So I, I guess I would start by saying, um, you know, I think we need to be honest that none of us show up to work as our best selves every day, right? Um, and I think that good people can make bad choices, especially in high stress situations. So that's why I think when we talk about policing um, and police reform, we most focus on the beliefs, policies, and practice, right, of our officers, because that's what develops the culture. And culture um, is what will decide how police engage in the community. Um, I think that with our police officers, um, it's very you know, important that we don't have an expectation for them to act as a mental health professional, especially walking into a crisis situation. I think that what we really need to do is to make sure that we have are investing in, you know, at one point, a long time ago in the city, we had a nurses corps here, right? Right now, we don't employ any of our mental health staff in the city of Schenectady, where, where we stand, so where we stand today. So I think it's really important that if we focus on the beliefs, policies, and practices, then we will create the conditions that when someone is not their best self at work, there's parameters in a culture that will prevent them from being their worst that can come in and can end up in some of the really uh, horrible outcomes that we've seen across the country. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Thank you. Ms. DeToro. Yes. So the police reform that the city carried out was, was very inclusive and, and thorough and included stakeholders from all the neighborhoods, 
Um, I support it completely. However, with that being said, the report is just the beginning, not the end. Community meetings will continue, um, and we, we need to discuss issues that impact everyone in the city. Um, I am, again, I'll state it, I'm, I'm in favor of fully staffing the police department, um, and I am definitely in support of a community engagement unit. Um, this unit will be instrumental in bridging and building trust between the police and the community. I also believe in embedding a mental health professional within the department for each shift to handle nonviolent mental health calls. And one thing I'd really love to see is I'd like to see a program where police officers are participating in early education. Um, not only would it bring them there to promote recruiting our own into the force, but help again build the trust between the police and the students. Um, uh, there would be, I'd, I'd like to have a uh, discover pol uh, pol policing program aimed at different age groups, for example, uh, young teen and young adults. Um, and I'd like to see the police be more active in the community. And as far as use of voice, force, um, uh, I support use of, of force. George, George Floyd, shame on that police officer. Thank you, Mr. Toro. Uh, Mr. Samuels, you're yeah, next. Yeah, so I'd like to start looking at it from the perspective of the mental health unit. I mean, there are agencies across the country that have done a pretty good job at implementing a mental health unit within the police force, mm -hmm. giving them the training to be able to go to uh, situations where they can defuse it without the use of guns. So when you look at installing a strong mental health unit, trained police officers who have the ability to defuse situations without guns that's going to minimize the need for use of force because at that same situation, you're not going to have to do knee holes or aggressively you know, apprehend people. You can talk them down because you have that skill set. So I believe the police, the police department should look at uh, train, uh, opportunities to speak to those other agencies like the city of San Antonio that's mastered this to see how we can implement this in Schenectady. And then along with community policing, that's another way to defuse situations where you don't have to use uh, force all the time. So if we have police walking the beat or riding bikes or on, on horses, getting to know everyone in the community, when situations arise, they can walk, you know, they can walk up to the folks that they know and call them by name and say, hey, what's going on? Let's talk about this and be able to defuse situations and not have, not, not, not have to use force to apprehend when, when situations are going down between domestic situations, friends on the streets, or even folks who are having uh, disagreements with one another. Thanks, Mr. Samuel. <laughs> Mr. Williams? So as a member of the Schenectady Steering Committee, which had a strong influence over the conversations, the community conversations that took hold in this uh, community in regards to police reform, currently as the acting chair in the Civilian Police Review Board, and as a member of the Schenectady Police Department Hiring Advisory Panel, I've had the opportunity of witnessing this, this issue from multi, multi different perspectives. Uh, I've come to recognize that as a young man of color, that police reform is not a light switch. Uh, it's a cultural mindset that is taken on gradually and it's understanding where we need to start and that's first at addressing what the issue is in order to continue forth with the progressive mindsets of chief clifford who has taken steps to addressing some of the issues it's understanding that the issues that we are prioritizing come in line with what the community is demanding and expecting one of the mechanisms that i think is best going to drive forth our police reform conversation in the city is community policing and it's by understanding that we need to have members of our community who are actively supporting our community included on the police task force. There's recently coming up a police exam in the fall of 2021, which I don't know how many people from our community are aware of. We need to make sure that whatever communication platforms we're engaging are effective and they're reaching the members that are talented in our community and looking for opportunities and ways to contribute more. So again, I think recruiting and community policing Similar to what Ms. DeToro, uh, reckon, uh, similar to what Ms. DeToro uh, mentioned, are ways that we can combat police reform to ensure that we are still striving to become the city that we, we need to be. Thank you very much. We'll move on to question number two, and this one will go first to Ms. Porterfield, and then we'll progress, and as I said, I'll give cues. So question number two is, there has been a significant investment in downtown in recent years and an additional $10 million in state downtown revitalization initiative projects was just announced. Meanwhile, representatives of the city's neighborhoods and residents who live there have expressed concerns about being neglected and services reduced. What would you do to support the city's neighborhoods? 
Ms. Porterfield. Thank you. So yes, there has been a lot of investment downtown, but I also want to bring forward the fact that there is a lot of investment now going on in communities. There's investment going on in, in Hamilton Hill where there's new um, housing being put up. There's also investment in currently in Mount Pleasant where there's new, um, there's a new, they're doing renovation to a park, but more is needed. So I would recommend that um, that the, the city would spend more money investing in the infrastructure, investing in bl blighted, um, taking down blighted properties, either restoring them or taking them down and creating a more livable uh, community. Um, part of it, or the other part that I feel I would, what I have done and will continue to do is to work on things that inform the quality of life. The quality of life is very important for people. So things such as speeding. Actually, I have to tell you that litter is also a major thing in the city, in our city, and how you, how how it looks where you live and, and impacts you. So also, I would work on making sure, or continue to work, is what I should say, on making sure that we have a clean city, a city where everyone's receiving the same services, that taxpayers um, get the services that they're paying for because we're paying high taxes. We all have to face that. But, but to also make sure that for the service that they're paying, that make sure that the city is doing that. And again, having a mechanism that residents have concerns, that they can voice those concerns to the city and that they are immediately addressed in all communities, regardless of where you live. Thank you, Mr. Mutuvern. Thank you. Yes, we have seen our fair share of uh, investment in Dong Chong, but uh, it's needed. And now we are seeing our focuses have been moving to the neighborhoods. And as Ms. Porterfield mentioned, we have seen investment in Hamilton Hill, Mount Pleasant, Central State. And we are finding across all neighborhoods to continue the revitalization of our neighborhood. So it's not happening at a pace that a neighborhood would like to see. But I think um, over the years, we'll see more investment in our neighborhood and attract um, investment, new homeowners and expand our tax base and at the same time um, look at the nuisance in our um, neighborhood and address all those problems. I think um, the focus is on our neighborhood now and we can physically see investment all over in the neighborhood, streets, sidewalks, and new infrastructure going up. So it's a matter of time that we continue what we're doing right now and to expand on what we're doing. Thank you. Mr. Farley? Okay. Um, so I think when we talk about economic uh, investment in our city and, and, and specifically downtown, um, it's really important that we recognize that it's not an either or, but it's actually should be a yes and. So meaning that yes, we should be doing things to attract businesses to our city, and we should be ensuring that those businesses that are coming to our city are not only going to set up in a, a thriving business, but they're going to incentivize ways to hire people who live in our community. When we talk about some of the development and how it can bring in, you know, uh, uh, people that want to live here and, and, and own property and, and become landlords, I want to make sure that we're doing the right things by taking these city properties um, and getting them back on, back on the tax roll. But we want to be really intentional that we're not just saying, okay, here for an absentee landlord to come here and make a, a short-term investment and leave the property and and really recognize the conditions that some of the residents are living in because they're living in these conditions are absentee landlords. So we have to, it's not just about um, the economic development, so it's not either or, it's yes and. So I think that as we start to see some of the uh, revitalization happen in the neighborhoods, it's important that we are getting the input from the people that live in the neighborhood. Again, we have really great things happening in the city, but unless somebody who lives in the city, lives in the neighborhood, can say, my quality of life has changed, um, then really we're missing the mark. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Ms. Saluski Welzunas. So I've listened to um, concerns throughout the neighborhoods. Um, we've had uh, issues with dirt bikes and ATVs. Um, we as a council just passed legislation so that we can now um, combat that issue. Uh, we do need to do more for the neighborhoods. Um, there has been development in Mount Pleasant. There's a Main Street grant that was just approved. Uh, there was a slight delay due to the pandemic, um, but there's, there's development going on in Goose Hill, Eastern Avenue, uh, but we need to do more, and we need to do more for the businesses. Um, I'd like to see more s facade programs, more Main Street grants. Um, each neighborhood is unique and has its own issues. Uh, I'd like to see us help more businesses by maybe forming um, business development 
um, assessment groups throughout the city. We have a very, very good one, uh, downtown Schenectady, the bid. I'd like to model and duplicate that throughout the neighborhoods. They've done a great job on Upper Union Street. Um, under the leadership of the bid, the bid could have a beautification uh, model. They would be able to um, have dedicated people to clean the streets, um, do flags, and put a marketing plan together. Um, I think it can be done across the city at a very minimal cost, and um, I think it's something we need to look into to help the businesses market themselves and the area that they're in. Thank you. The question now goes to Mr. Samuel. <clears throat> so 15 years ago, um, when the, revital the revitalization effort began, it was necessary. Um, downtown was, um, you know, almost a ghost land. I remember driving down there when I first moved here and just being surprised that there was nothing there um, to attract other folks into the city. Um, I must say that the job that the mayor and the city council have done over, the, over, the, over that time has been tremendous, and it's brought businesses into the city which have attracted others to Schenectady as well. And now most of us, when we walk around, we're very proud to say that we, we live in Schenectady. You know, unfortunately, um, that same level of effort hasn't been um, issued into the neighborhoods. Um, there are neighborhoods um, that we know that have deteriorated over the years, um, and we haven't really put a lot of focus into um, turning those neighborhoods around. You know, what I'd like to see is grants um, that are given to the residents to, you know, you know, update your siding, you know, put new windows in, look at piping and infrastructure, you know, make sure that the, the potholes on the roads uh, are cleared, and just have that effort going forward. The city has, you know, the, the revitalization of downtown has been successful. Let's turn that same effort to the communities so that we can look at all of Schenectady and be like, wow, Schenectady really made a major turnaround from downtown to Stockade to Mount Pleasant to every neighborhood in the city. So I think most of the effort should be put going forward and the funding that we get from the, city, from the government and other places to revitalize in all the neighborhoods. Thank you, Mr. Samuel. Mr. Williams. So out of the 70 plus hours that Hyleb, uh, Hyleb Samuel and myself have walked around the city of Schenectady, we recognize the very uh, vague understanding that all of Schenectady does not resonate downtown. Um, it was meant to be a joke, but the issue at hand is not a laughing matter. Um, although, similar to Mr. Samuel, what he mentioned, the efforts of the Downtown Revitalization Initiative is very, very successful. I have friends who live in other areas of the Capital District who absolutely love coming and supporting the businesses that thrive down, downtown. And that, 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 that opens us up to a new network of, of economic success, which I appreciate. Uh, thank you to, to the mayor and, his, and his, his wisdom with that. However, we cannot simply visit neighborhoods only during political cycles, expecting them to be completely bought in into the process. Um, the amount of time that I've spent walking around Schenectady, I've witnessed there are various neighborhoods that have not been visited and who have been neglected. Um, and it's as obvious as what Councilman Porterfield mentioned with littering, but then it gets even deeper into having um, absent maintenance in streets and that is very disheartening to, to someone like me who sees Schenectady from a different light. So for me, it's understanding that although I am one resident in this very vast community, the people that know what they need resonate in those neighborhoods. I'm promoting myself as a candidate that is going to reach those individuals, bring them into these conversations, and help institute collaborative change. Because as you can tell, I'm only 31 years old. I don't know everything. However, I know that when you bring more decision makers to the table, the solutions that you come up with are have a, mo a momentous effect. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Williams. And finally, Ms. DeToro. Um, so I'd just like to, to touch briefly on the $10 million um, downtown um, revitalization initiative grant. So um, that money uh, was received for specific locations only. Um, unfortunately, most of the city neighborhoods did not fall into this zone. So again, it was just given for specific areas. As far as um, the neighborhoods, um, a lot of development has continued to occur um, from the downtown. We've spidered out into different neighborhoods. Um, Mount Pleasant has received a grant to renew their facades, Crane Street, um, but more is definitely needed. Um, I would like to focus on our two entry points, uh, Van Franken Avenue and um, uh, Broadway in Vel Bellevue. Um, there should be a real focus to clean up these two entry points to develop a business district or a merchant association uh, the associations in both of those areas are, are vibrant, alive, and huge. And um, uh, people in those areas and, and the entire city take enormous pride 
Um, so I'd also like to, I strongly believe in hiring more code enforcement staff to crack down on the, prod, the bladed properties, zombie properties, um, and to make uh, absentee landlords accountable for um, uh, the, the properties here in the city. Um, one initiative I'd like to see is for the city to provide incentives to uh, purchase two family homes um, to like artists. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to number three in the questions. The city will receive upwards of $60 million in coronavirus recovery funding this year. How do you think the city should use the money? And this question goes first to Mr. Mutuvern. Thank you. We are fortunate that the federal government um, provide us with 50, $58 million in federal relief through the stimulus grant. Some of the program that we need to look at, we need to look first of all is to balance our budget and at the same time um, paid off our debt that we have taken to, through the COVID. We also need to look at our infrastructure and the things that are badly needed and to fill the many vacancies that is there with us, especially our police and fire. We have a lot of vacancies within the OGS office and other departments. So primarily we need to focus on hiring. We need to improve our service. We need to balance the budget and look at the neighborhood, spend some money towards our neighborhood. And this is an opportunity for us to reach out and to pick back on the first question. The second question is that this is time for us to use some of this funding towards our neighborhood. And as we look at balance, reducing taxes, which is very important, these are all opportunity that we can use these, this $58 million to enhance. And at the same time, I would like the mayor and the city council to reach out to the community to get their input as we spend this money. It's very important that we embrace the neighborhood and to seek advice from all stakeholders. Thank you. Mr. Farley? Okay, so I, I would say that um, I don't think anyone here today is really in a position uh, qualified position to answer that question. And I think the reason I, I say that is because this is, we have a great opportunity to demonstrate, once again, that we're making decisions with people and not for them. So in order for this, for this fund um, to be spent in an equitable way that improves the quality of life for Schenectady residents, Schenectady residents have to be at the table. And it can't be one of those things where tradition stifles innovation. We can't just say, let's hold a public hearing with maybe one or two people come. You know, our city council <laughs> meetings are not the most robust that they could be, right? Let's be honest about that. And I think that if we use the same, you know, when you don't know what to do, you do what you know. And if we keep continue to do what we know, then we'll, we'll be making decisions again for people and not with them. So I think that what, what we really need to focus on creating a very real equitable task force where we are tapping on people in the community and not just the usual suspects at the table and saying this is the, the funds and the resources that we have here and we want to allocate them in a way that is meaningful and improves your quality of life. So we not only welcome you to the table in a performative way, but we're really listening and we're taking some time and making those assessments and every decision that we make for every single dollar is aligned and driven by what the people of Schenectady want. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zalewski Wildsinis. So it has been a very challenging 18 month period with the pandemic. I feel we're gonna come back stronger. This is federal money. There are rules and regulations around it. So we do need to work collaboratively. We need to ensure that this money is uh, allocated in the appropriate manner um, that the federal government has, has required us to. Uh, with that said, um, we do need to listen to our constituents, um, but I've heard from some constituents, and we have an aging system. Um, our, our roads, our sidewalks, our water and sewer, um, you know, we're an extremely old city, and we need to ensure that our infrastructure is taken care of. Uh, we need to update improvements in the park. We need to make our parks better. We've started, we have new Orchard Park coming online. Uh, Central Park needs to have some attention to it, hasn't really had any. We have old tennis courts that, uh, and a casino building that need to be repurposed. The pool needs to be updated. Um, we need to put additional lighting throughout the parks. The Central Park Music Haven attracts people from all across the capital region. Um, they're here to hear 
free music in the park. We need to enhance the lighting. Our police and fire departments need to be fully staffed, as do all the departments within the city. So I would be lobbying for that. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Porterfield? Thank you. So um, I will agree with Mr. Mudevarian that we would want to uh, balance our budget. Uh, with COVID, as everyone knows, we've lost a lot of revenue. So that we can, so we, to put that money back, so that to make sure that, our, that we have enough money um, in our budget to, to continue to run the city going forward. This is a probably one-time event. So we have to be extremely careful in how we spend this money. So I can't say exactly how we should spend it, but I will say that we have to look at the criteria because with money comes criteria. So we'd have to look at the criteria in which the government says, this is how you can use that money. Some of it is very flexible. I did take time to look into that. So I agree that we definitely need to work on our infrastructure. We have a failing infrastructure here in the city. And also to spend money in, we talked about our neighborhoods for just a moment, but to invest, this is an opportunity to invest some of that money into the neighborhoods that haven't had that major investment as downtown has had. So I would strongly, strongly uh, advocate for that. To work on some of these blighted properties to remove them. To um, fix our sidewalks. We, we're a community, for whatever reason, people walk in the street a lot, and it's not safe. And to work on, um, to make sure that our sidewalks are comfortable for people pushing strollers, for those who walk and don't ha are not um, driving vehicles, for bicyclers, all of those things. The potholes uh, need to be taken care of. As I've said before, and I'll say again, I believe in participatory government. So I believe that we should ask people to come to the table and give their ideas and do m as much of what their input is as humanly possible. Thank you very much. Uh, the question goes next to Mr. Williams. So similar to what our three incumbents, uh, Karen Zelensko Azunas, Marion Porterfield, and uh, John Mudevarian have mentioned, uh, this is a once in a generational amount of money that's going to be thrusted into our, into our city, similar to where the Scantity City School District is, is positioned with as well. Uh, there, um, there are basic me mechanisms to help recover economies such as having low to zero interest loans, but it is important that we make sure that we're rebuilding our infrastructure and understanding the magnitude of this amount of investment. This is not a time where we need to be coy. We need to be very imaginative in understanding what is the potential uh, reach we can have for these monies. Um, in addition to supporting our ancillary and municipality forces, we need to ensure that we are investing in our community resources that are providing equitable opportunities for our young and developing minds. Uh, if we continue to only look at one segment of what the city is meant to be, we will miss various uh, opportunities to address some of the underlying issues of why Schenectady is currently becoming an aging community. Uh, I chose to move here because I saw the, the value in this community that invested so much in me. And I think if we do not address that issue and make this a, a desirable location for young and developing families, we will no longer be existing. And I know that that is a very grimmest future, but I understand the importance of continuing this trend of success, and we need to make sure that we are directing these funds to all areas of our city for the long-term benefits. Thank you very much. Ms. DeToro? So as we move closer uh, to normalcy, um, out of this pandemic, Schenectady must rebuild its infrastructure, both physically and with its human resources. Um, to accomplish this, I believe, um, a combination of hiring and uh, more staffing and bringing in outside contractors is needed. I am a strong advocate again for fully staffed police and fire to lessen the resilience on overtime. Furthermore, I propose a community engagement union and mental health professionals are embedded within the department. The rules and the regulations of the $58 million um, stimulus money have not yet been provided by the federal government. Therefore. Uh, I will answer this question with that understanding. First, money should be used to fix city roads. Um, yes, we should listen to um, residents, but I think um, what we've heard here tonight and everyone said and every resident would be the same thing, quality of life issues. Um, potholes repairs are necessary. At the, at the same time, some manhole covers um, uh, act as potholes on many roads throughout the city. They should be raised so that they're even with the streets. The same could be said of street cutouts, which require enforcement by our city to ensure that national grid, plumbers, and electrician repair cutouts properly. Secondly, our parks are in general despair. They need attention and stronger investment, for Central Park needs a new pool. 
Thank you. And finally, on this question, Mr. Samuel. <clears throat> COVID-19 is a once in a generational pandemic. In fact, sometimes it skips generations. You don't see a pandemic of this level. We're still learning the impacts of COVID-19 from a health perspective, from a mental health perspective, and also from a financial perspective. It's uh, you know, very enticing when you get a, you know, $60 million to be so quick to want to start saying we should spend it here and spend it there. But similar to, to what Mr. Farley said, you know, we need to have a comprehensive study to first understand the impacts of COVID-19 long term and then start looking at where we should be allocating that money. Because the money is coming to the city because of COVID-19, so we should use that as the catalyst into what we're doing with that money. Saying that, I do think it's an opportunity to solve some problems. Under COVID-19, unemployment went to 17.5% in the city of Schenectady, and it's not coming down quickly enough. So I think we should use some of that money to have job training, to get people back into the workforce, and also use it to create jobs within the city, because it makes sense, because that'll help us drive unemployment, unemployment down, which is going to fuel our economy to make sure the city has a great uh, revitalization. Also something I feel is very important, and I know this from t speaking to friends and family all across the city and in other cities around, the mental health issue. A lot, there are a lot of kids who are struggling because of COVID-19. What are we going to do about that? We have $60 million. Let's, let's use some of that funding to make sure that healthcare professionals are available to these families so that we can get back to our right mental state to move forward into 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to question number four. Many neighborhood streets are dangerous for people walking and riding bikes due to design flaws and deferred maintenance. Speeding and unsafe driving are commonplace across the city and sidewalks are often in such poor condition that people with mobility limitations have to walk in the street. Do you support lowering the citywide speed limit to 25 miles per hour? What else would you do to make our streets safer for residents? And this question goes first to Mr. Farley. Okay. So, um, yes, I do support that. Absolutely, I do. And I think that um, when we talk about safety, safety means uh, different things for different people. Um, I think about, um, you know, the youth uh, program that we uh, designed as a response to the pandemic and um, the, what we thought were going to be some pretty drastic uh, cuts to our school system. And I remember dropping one of our youth home uh, and our youth come from very different parts of the city. So we were walking, dropping one kid off and one of the other kids got out of the van to say goodbye to him and he was eating something and he threw the wrapper on the floor. He immediately picked the wrapper up. Now this is a young man that we constantly tell all the time, pick up your stuff, pick up your stuff. So I was curious to say, well, why did you just pick it up that quick? This young man happened to live in a pretty nice neighborhood. And he said to me, well, this doesn't look like the type of neighborhood that you can just throw your stuff on the ground. So that young man, he already knew, not this is, you know, maybe his first, second, third time in this neighborhood, he already understood by just looking at the place he was at, that it was unacceptable for him to throw some trash on the ground. And he self-corrected without us saying anything. That was because the conditions of that neighborhood, there's a clear expectation that you take care of this neighborhood. Unfortunately, it wasn't the neighborhood that that young man lived in, but I say that point because I think that that illustrates the fact that if we want to have safe neighborhoods then we must invest in fixing these potholes making sure the garbage and everything is up and invest in our city workers so they can do a job do the job that they want to do to keep it the way it needs to be so let's demonstrate that by investing in our neighborhoods sorry thank you Mr. Yeah. Farley uh, Ms. Saluski Walzunas uh, so s several months ago we actually put a resolution forward to the um, Assembly and Senate to see about getting our speed limit lowered. I am a huge supporter of this. Um, I, I believe that we, it, it is a major quality of life issue. Um, we've, we've attacked the dirt bikes and ATVs uh, with new legislation. I think the speeding is, a, is another one that, you know, I would be lobbying once again so that we have the ability to lower that speed. Um, along with what Mr. Farley said, you're correct. Um, it depends on what neighborhood you're in, but litter needs to be addressed as a major quality of life issue. And um, it's across the city. It's, it's, it's in all neighborhoods. And I believe what we need to do is ensure that when um, they have uh, garbage pickup days, that after that we have a, a, a system where the street cleaners come out and they clean the streets so that our, our, um, our garbage handling individuals are not slowed down 
by picking up minor pieces of litter that may have fallen out or blown out of the truck. Uh, so I think there's some things that we can do to combat that. Um, but I would be a huge proponent of ensuring that the speed limit is reduced. Um, and we need to utilize, uh, I know that we have the signs for speeding throughout the city, and I think we need to continue to use those so people understand how fast they are going. Thank you very much, Ms. Porterfield. Thank you. So I, as Ms. zaluski has said, we have uh, put legislation forward to lower the speed limit, which I do also strongly support because it is very dangerous for individuals walking with, um, you know, with the speeding that we have. That is something, speeding is something that I have been talking about on this council for a number of months and how we can address it and that we need to address it. I'm hearing from residents that their whose homes have people have literally run into their homes as a result of speeding. So one of the things that we were able to do was to put some money in the budget. Um, I would thank my colleagues for supporting it where we could put something called speed humps so that it would slow the traffic down. That is one of the recommendations that I have put forward that I uh, would like to see. Uh, we're we're in almost into summer now and that we should really start doing that so that people are slowing down because I only see this as getting worse as the weather gets a warmer. So yes, we should do that. And, and as also has been said, we should also just look at our neighborhoods overall. People have different respect for neighborhood dep depending on how a neighborhood is kept and what is tolerated. And we should also use law enforcement uh, to you uh, when people are speeding. I think that having law enforcement at certain places and people being ticketed lets people realize that this will not be tolerated in our community. Um, and we want to make sure that our individuals are as safe as, as I've said. So um, speeding is a major issue. As I walk the streets uh, and campaigning, I'm hearing that from the residents a lot. Thank you very much. Mr. Mertuver. Thank you. We as a council, we have been discussing speeding for quite some time now. And we recently passed a resolution seeking a home rule through the state. And if that is, if you're fortunate enough to have that home rule in our favor, we were able to reduce the speed to 25 miles, which many of us on the council support. I'm a big supporter of that in terms of that. And we continue to address as a council. Last Monday, we addressed um, speeding signs. And I think we're going to be rolling out um, some signs with, in terms of um, piloting out to see how it's faring in different neighborhoods. And if it's, if it's good and it's acceptable in the neighborhood, we'll intend to, um, to keep it there and to fund these signs in our capital um, budget at the end of this year into next year. So that is something is very um, concerned to all of us on the council. We are addressing it. We, we are knocking on doors and we are hearing all the complaints from residents. We do hear your complaints. We are concerned about the speeding at the same time. But I want to remind residents out there that um, we do have a sidewalk program and we encourage neighborhood um, organization, residents in various streets to reach out to, um, to your council member and we can guide you in terms of how you can able to access the sidewalk uh, pilot project that we have available. We had set aside $1 million a year ago for that prog a program. We still have funding available. So I encourage people to you know, reach out to us. We can tell you what you have to do and we can be able to repair sidewalks and make it more walkable that people don't have to use the street. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. DeToro, you start the next. Um, I would be a, a huge uh, proponent of lowering the speed limit to 25 miles an hour um, uh, to for safe neighborhoods. Um, understaffing of the Schenectady Police Department undermines traffic and uh, pedestrian enforcements. Um, so we lower the we lower the speed limit, but there's not enough staffing to enforce the speed limit. Um, I also know that the city has purchased. Um, speed bumps, um, portable speed bumps that they put in roadways. Um, I've lived in this city many years and I've never seen a speed bump located anywhere in the city. Um, visiting thousands of, not thousands, over a thousand uh, individuals as I'm walking campaigning. Um, I think the main, one of the main concerns I hear every single night, no matter what, in, in every neighborhood is speed, speed, speed. Um, as we're walking, we can, we can see it. The, the people are just, um, um, speeding down down the street so I know the police department has um, some some uh, machines that they put out and they say slow down and, and record your speed limit but again without uh, being able to enforce the people who are speeding um, 
it really doesn't do much good. But I, again, I am a big proponent in lowering the speed limit. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Samuel. <clears throat> yes, I'm a proponent of lower, lowering the speed limit. I mean, I lived for, fear, for years in fear when my kids were growing up because my streets are cross streets, so cars would just come flying by all the time. Um, but I mean, similar to what uh, Councilman Porterfield said, you know, lowering speed limit is one thing, but enforcing it is something else. Um, and that's coupled with the running of, you know, stop signs at four-way stops. It happens all the time, um, and it's not enforced. And I know that, you know, uh, Mr. Tori Mr. Torrio is saying that, you know, policing is a, a limited amount of policing to handle this, but there are technologies that can handle this. You know, some of the smart city initiatives that the mayor is trying to push forward, you know, we can implement those technologies so that, you know, when cars are speeding, you know, we can, you know, bounce off the license plate and get that license plate and send them tickets to their homes. And if they have multiple infractions, then actually, you know, bring them into court and, you know, and cite them for that. Um, so I, I just think we, it's going to be a concerted effort of technology, policing, um, I also speed bumps. I think speed bumps are very necessary in many places. You know, coming up with a system for streets to um, say, hey, we need speed bumps on our street. You know, what's the process to do that and make it easy and accessible to folks, um, particularly areas where you have a high number of kids, um, like my neighborhood. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of lowering the speed limit. Thank you. And Mr. Williams. So similar to what Mr. Toro and uh, Mr. Samuel mentioned, uh, an unenforceable law is merely a suggestion. And I would hate to lower the speed limit to only p penalize the city's drivers who are following the law and have the individuals that are continuing to break it still going by uh, un un unaddressed. Uh, I am for lowering the speed limit if that is the, the unanimous consention or the overwhelming majority vote from the community because as a city council member, it is not what I want to do. I am merely an advocate for change and I'm here to represent the voices of the entire community. Uh, but I want to ensure that whatever policies we put forth, that we use uh, critical thinking and apply that with community input to ensure that our decisions represent what this community and city desire. However, in regards to the sidewalks, I think it's important to understand that we do not put our communities and our neighborhoods against each other, which commonly happens when we do not roll out transparent plans for how we are going to affect change for everyone. So I think it's important that regardless of how we enact speed humps or lowering the speed limits, or correcting any other issues, it's ensuring that the community is aware of our collective approach so that we do not have another downtown revitalization uh, impact where individuals are seeing changes afar, assuming and left up to their demise and left up to their understandings of when it's going to reach their doorsteps. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. And with that, we're going to conclude this portion of the, uh, the forum for the City Council. I want to thank everybody for these excellent questions. Thankful for their thoughtful questions and thank you for the, the two organizations that put these together. Uh, so in order to stay on the schedule, we're gonna uh, allow you guys to leave and thank you very much and then we'll get the, we'll take a minute or two to let you move on and then we'll get the two uh, county legislature candidates up here in just a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Savage, so for the, the folks listening online and back home, 
This is the portion where we're going to have our two candidates for one seat for the Schenectady County Legislature. And this is District 1 that represents the city of Schenectady. So on the left, we have Omar Sterling McGill. And on the right, we have Brendan Savage. We're going to start as we did with the other ones. Each candidate will have two minutes to do a brief uh, introduction and hello. And then we'll jump into some questions. So uh, Mr. Savage, if you would like to start. Thank you, Miles, and thank you for, uh, to the Schenectady United Neighborhoods and the NAACP for hosting this forum tonight. My name is Brandon Savage. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Schenectady County, a homeowner in the city's north side, only 500 yards from the house I grew up in with my eight brothers and sisters. I'm running for Schenectady County Legislature District 1 because I believe our county government has done a terrific job in spearheading revitalization in downtown Schenectady. And I believe that we can build on that momentum, focus on the neighborhoods, and make sure this revitalization reaches every corner of our city. I believe my five-point plan provides a good roadmap to accomplish this, to fix our roads, to repair and revitalize vacant housing, reduce litter, improve trash pickup procedures, make our streets safer through community policing, and finally bring a grocery store to District 1, which is a food desert and the only district in the entire county without a supermarket. My plans are informed by my work with Metroplex, the Capital Region Land Bank, the Albany County District Attorney's Office, but my proudest accomplishment is working on Joe Biden's campaign last year. I believe President Biden's plans provide, that provide the city and county with $88 million in combined funding, funding will give us the opportunity to work together and build back better in Schenectady than ever before. This year's been tough on everyone. I think we all know someone who's lost a loved one, loved one to COVID-19. We've seen small businesses close, some that might never come back. And for the entire community, just the isolation has been difficult. In my own family, myself and my eight brothers and sisters lost our father in April, and it was tough not being able to have friends and family around in person for a proper funeral. But what's true about Schenectady is true about all of us. We get knocked down, but we don't stay down. We get back up. And I'm confident we can come back from the COVID-19 pandemic stronger than ever before. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Savage. And now Mr. McGill. Good evening to everyone. Um, I would like to first thank the Schenectady United Neighborhoods Association and the Schenectady NAACP for having this forum. I'd like to thank Brendan Savage for joining us tonight um, as well. Um, my name is Omar Sterling McGill. I was born and raised in Schenectady, um, in specifically District 1. Um, I graduated from Morehouse College in Atlanta, and I've been working at the New York State Legislature for the past uh, six years. I've worked on the policy side in, in the State Assembly, and I've worked, for the last three years, I've worked as a New York State Senate Journal clerk. Um, the reason why I'm running for county legislature is because I've been focused on the county for the last few years. Um, I want to run for a position where I can make, be the change that I want to see. Um, we are all going through an unprecedented time of crisis, whether environmental, economical, racial, or justice. And I think we've been, I think justice has been delayed too long by business as usual. Um, I think my plan of economic revitalization by focusing on our neighborhoods, improving our focus, improving our infrastructure by focusing on climate change, um, government, making sure our government is accessible and transparent to our constituents. Um, making sure that our health care is doing what it's supposed to do by the people of Schenectady and recognition that representation matters is tailor-made to, to deal with the crises that we face currently today. Um, it is important to me to serve, this, to serve District 1 because my, my family is rooted here. I've done a lot of community work, but I think it's time to take it to a next level, and I think I will be the best representative for Schenectady County District 1 and Schenectady County as a whole. So I thank you, and I thank you for having me for this evening. Thank you, Mr. McGill. For question number one, in light of growing concerns about systemic racism in America, how do you envision making a change in the inequities that black and brown people suffer, and how do you propose to do so without creating further division of all our citizens? For this question, we'll start with Mr. Savage. You have 90 seconds. I, as part of my five-point plan, a big focus is on community policing, working with our county sheriff's department, working with the city police department and Chief Clifford, also our street crimes task force. I know a big issue around the country has been inequities in our criminal justice system. And we need a nationwide effort to solve these issues, but we also need 
an effort here in Schenectady County to solve these issues. Um, we were talking in the, uh, they were talking, the city council candidates, about some of the changes they'd like to make, uh, getting rid of uh, need and neck holds. Uh, but I'd also, um, as part of this, working with District Attorney Carney, uh, making sure that not every situation in our criminal justice system where we see these inequities um, ends up in, it doesn't have to be in the criminal justice system. We can have alternatives to incarceration to make sure young first time offenders uh, you know, don't have a spot on their record when they're trying to you know, start out in life that could affect their employment forever. Um, I also um, believe that uh, with the city and the county, uh, we have, or at the county level, we have 24-7 hour, or 24-7 Northern Rivers uh, social workers through Central Dispatch. We can improve the um, diversity in our policing with the County uh, uh, Civil Service Commission, and I'll leave it Thank there. you, Mr. Savage. Mr. McGill. Thank you. Systemic racism is an issue that, like the question said, that we suffer all across the country. Um, within Schenectady County, it is important that we face these issues head on. How do we do that? I think it's important that everybody feel a part of the team. And once they look up at the county legislature right now, everybody doesn't feel a part of the team because everybody's not represented at the county level. So it starts there so people feel comfortable talking to their leadership because the leadership should reflect the community in which it serves. So we start there and we talk to the, we get to the people to the table that can really relate to the people who are suffering through these issues. You can't relate if you don't have anybody there that's able to go through the issues that we are talking about when it regards to black and brown people and the inequities. Um, I think it's important that everybody's voices is heard, are, are heard. I think we all make up Schenectady County, all of our power, all of our pain, all of our skills, and all of our unique talents. So for us to really, really take a dive and, and really, really try to change systemic racism, systemic racism, excuse me, it is important that we all be at that table to make sure we realize and understand what the actual racism is. It's hard for you to understand if you don't go through it. It's hard for you to understand if you're not in contact with the people who actually go through it. I myself is, is an individual have not really received as much systemic racism, but I understand what it is to be a black and brown man in this community and in this country. So I think it's very important that we do, we start there with representation. Thank you, Mr. McGill. So for question number two, there has been a significant investment in downtown in recent years and an additional $10 million in state downtown revitalization initiative projects was just announced. Meanwhile, representatives of the city's neighborhoods and residents there have expressed concerns about being neglected and services reduced. What would you do to support the city's neighborhood? And this question goes first to Mr. McGill. Thank you for this question. Uh, I think the economic revitalization in downtown has been great. I think it's very important to the county because the city of Schenectady is the economic, in my opinion, the economic engine, if you will, for the county as a whole. But our neighborhoods have suffered too long. And we have to meet our neighborhoods where they're at. Every neighborhood is unique. Every neighborhood doesn't need the same thing. Some neighborhoods need their blighted properties to be fixed. Some neighborhoods like Bellevue need more, more attention in the fact that they don't have access to healthy food or their CVS has been, has been taken away. Some neighborhoods need more green spaces to help climate change and to be able to help maybe turn some of our properties or our lots into community gardens where we can have access to healthy food. It's very difficult to get a grocery store in District 1. We haven't been able to do it. People have been trying to do it for a while. So how do we hit that head on? We, we create more community gardens. We teach our kids how to be sustainable, how to grow their own food. That creates community. It creates self-sustainability, and it also gives people access to those healthy foods, and that's what we need to do. Um, the neighborhoods, as I listen to constituents, as I'm hitting the ground and going to the doors, everything, each, each, each neighborhood is unique. So we have to make sure when we're doing this revitalization, we have to hear from our constituents, and we have to keep them at the top of the forefront because it's important to hear what they want for their community. It's not up to us to decide for them. It's for us to decide, to decide with them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGill. Mr. McGill. Mr. Savage. So even on my lawn signs, I put right on the top, focus on the neighborhoods, because I believe we need to build off the momentum of downtown, but make sure that we get, we bring this revitalization to other corners of the city that have not received the same attention. I challenge anybody in the media after this 
go to the corner of Girling and Lancaster Street. The roads are in very poor condition. Uh, so as part of my five point plan, I'd like to bring this revitalization out, fix our roads using long lasting materials, uh, repair and revitalize vacant housing, but also tear down the worst of the worst properties that cannot, uh, that cannot be fixed. Uh, make our streets safer through community policing, making sure that we have the proper staffing levels that uh, call, emergency calls are responded to in a quick manner. Um, but then also, I, uh, I do believe we do have an opportunity to bring a grocery store to District 1, the only district without a, a supermarket. Uh, when, uh, if you look back 15 years ago when my mother was chair of the legislature, it probably wouldn't have been viable, but we've seen a lot of progress apartments coming in downtown. We have federal funding coming in, and I think we have a once-in-a-life oppor opportunity to solve this issue, to finally get a grocery store. And I will also say a big complaint I see in our neighborhoods is the amount of trash, uh, the amount of litter, and I believe a lot of this, uh, we can improve trash pickup procedures working with the, with the city. Uh, we can automate trash pickup, use heavy-duty trash cans, and I think we can build back better here in Schenectady County. Thank you, Mr. Savage. Question number three, poor street lighting and lack of adequate sidewalks in many of our neighborhoods leave residents feeling unsafe. Other cities have implemented complete streets policies and taken steps to improve lighting and pedestrian safety. How can the county help neighborhoods address these issues? And this question goes to you, Mr. Savage. So I, I have seen this myself. I do believe that uh, they're just walking door to door, there's a lot of sidewalks in poor conditions. There's places where there could be sidewalks where there aren't sidewalks. So I do be believe we need a complete streets plan in the city. And I think the county can be a supporter of those plans, sometimes in providing funding. Um, and I, I do think that uh, we need to make sure with some of this money coming in that we're using it to make our city more walkable, more bikeable, um, using it to, you know, some street diets to make sure people aren't speeding down the roads. Uh, that's another walkability issue. People aren't gonna feel safe walking if there's a car going 45 miles per hour where they're supposed to be going 30. I saw it yesterday in on Eastern Ave when I was going door to door. So I think the county needs to work cooperatively, cooperatively with the city and make sure there's proper funding to make sure Schenectady's a livable, walkable, bikeable place uh, because a lot of our population does not have cars, uh, and I believe this is a really important issue. Thank you. Mr. McGill. Yes, the, um, the walkability of the city of Schenectady, and specifically in District 1, is very, very important. Uh, you know, District 1 encompasses downtown, which a lot, has a lot of our art, um, art and tourism sites, and also our neighborhoods need to make sure that our, um, excuse me, sidewalks and roads are um, able to be used in a safe way. Um, we have a lot of families, young children in our district, um, mothers who have to may, be, may not have a car, may have to walk to work, and you see them pushing their child in a stroller in the street. You see a lot of our young people riding their bikes in the street, which is dangerous for both drivers on the road and more dangerous for our young people who are riding their bikes. Why are they doing this? Because our sidewalks are simply not safe. Um, it is important that the county support the city and collaborate with the city government to make sure that we are remedy, um, um, making sure we are coming to solutions to make sure that we smooth all our sidewalks. I think it's important that not only that we do that with our sidewalks, but we do that in other areas as well. It's important that the city government and the county government make sure their communications lines remain open as they are now, but we look to collab and support each other. And I think a great way to do that is to start with our sidewalks, and a great way to continue doing that, excuse me, is to start with our sidewalks and our roads, um, because it's important for the safety of our young people, for the safety of our families, and for the safety of overall people of Schenectady County. Thank you, Mr. McGill. Uh, question number four, and this one goes to Mr. McGill, Mr. McGill first. What is your position on a requirement for the sponsors of community and ec economic development projects that receive public funding to hire minority slash women owned businesses and to employ local labor from underrepresented black and brown communities in both temporary and permanent job opportunities? Please explain how you would advocate for diversity in the workforce. Thank you for that question. Um, I think it's very important. I think if, uh, 
if people want to invest in our communities, they need to make sure that the people who are going to be most affected by this development are getting those jobs. Um, I think it does a couple of things. I think it shows that it gives people to take pride in their own community when they're working on improving their own community. I think it keeps the tax dollars within our county because we're paying people who actually live in our community, so that helps our local economy. And I think it is important that when we, when we ask these developers to come in, that we hold them to this. Um, because we, the, the, our workforce, if we want our leadership to reflect our community, our workforce should reflect our community. So we gotta remove barriers, barriers of the civil service exam. We have to incorporate training programs, whether it be with partnerships with the Schenectady High School or our world-renowned SCC institution, or maybe even, Union, maybe even Union College, excuse me, where we can create programs where we can prepare people for the civil service exam so we can help them pass this exam. That's a very, very tough exam, but people can pass it if they get their proper training. People can pass it if they're, if they're able to be prepared for it without, no matter their educational background. So I think it's important that we remove those barriers of the civil service exam. We make sure that people that want to invest in our communities do hire women, do hire people of black and brown because it will keep our tax dollars in our local community and in our county. Thank you, Mr. McGill. And Mr. Savage. I, I know with the current economic development contracts, there are incentives um, to work with minority and uh, women-owned businesses, but I believe there can be more to be done to make sure that the workforce on these projects are people that live in Schenectady uh, and that the workforce on these projects are reflect the diversity of Schenectady as well. Um, so I think perhaps it's something we should look at as a county and not only uh, in bolstering the state or the state um, incentives uh, to making sure that when a, when a project comes in, um, maybe you know, if they're receiving taxpayer money, I do think there's an expectation that it should be those jobs, when able, should be going to the people who live in the city of Schenectady. That's something I would support, um, and that's something I would advocate for if I'm elected to the county legislature. Thank you very much, Mr. Savage. So uh, we're, we're, our time is winding down now, but we do have enough time for some closing statements. So we're going to uh, open the floor to Mr. McGill for 90, sections of a, uh, 90 seconds of a closing statement, and then we'll move to Mr. Savage and we'll be winding up at that point, so. Thank you for the questions that we have received tonight. Um, I think it's important that we, um, as, as people begin to go to the polls, to understand that I'm in this, my heart is in, this, in the work. My heart is in this work because my heart is in this community because I am from this community. Um, working at the New York State Legislature has provided me the um, opportunity to be able to look at a side from both perspectives and be able to make an informed policy decision. I understand that it's a give and take, but I understand that the people have to be at the forefront of every decision that we make. We have to make policy, we have to make policy with our constituents. We cannot just make policy for our constituents. We have to be accessible. We have to be transparent. I want to make sure that we have town halls that we work with our community so we can hear them, we can understand what they want to see. Everybody's not going to want to be able to see the same thing, but we want to make sure that we hear them so we can try to make the best decision that can, that can satisfy the major, as many people as we possibly can. Um, early voting does start this the 12th through the 22nd, um, and you can vote at the um, Schenectady Library across from the City Hall. The primary date is June 22nd. Um, if you need more information about me, you can go to my website at omarforschenectady.com. Um, I would love to hear from my constituents. Um, let us know what you want to see for the county. And as your elected official, I will represent you to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for having me tonight. And I hope you vote for me in this upcoming primary election on the working families and the Democratic Party line. Thank you, Mr. McGill and Mr. Savage. I want to once again uh, thank Mr. Reed for moderating this forum tonight uh, for our host. Schenectady United Neighborhood, the NAACP, um, and I thank you for giving us this platform to reach all voters. Uh, and I've been knocking on doors throughout this city, but not everyone's home all the time, so it's great that they have the opportunity to listen to us, share our perspectives. Uh, my message has been the same throughout this campaign. Focus on the neighborhoods, fix our roads, revitalize vacant housing, reduce litter, improve trash pickup, make our streets safer through community policing, and finally bringing a grocery store to District 1 and solving food deserts. My campaign is endorsed by Assemblyman Angelo Santa Barbara, 
It's endorsed by all six county legislators uh, who are representing the city of Schenectady. And today I was just uh, endorsed by CSEA, uh, one of the largest unions in the capital region. I will be a fighter for working families. I'll be a fighter for quality of life issues and making sure that our county government is responsive to all our neighborhoods, not just downtown. I hope I can earn your support on June 22nd at your local polling place, or if you'd like to, go vote early uh, in the nine days of early voting starting at the Karen B. Johnson Library this Saturday. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you, Mr. Savage, and thank you, Mr. McGill, for the excellent uh, answers. I think it's been a great, robust uh, forum. I wanna also, again, thank Sun for putting this on, especially Tom Carey for persevering despite many scheduling challenges and, and, and other things, and the NAACP also. And most of all, I wanna thank Proctors, and I wanna thank the Proctors production crew because I do know that after the pandemic and we've all been on Zoom and the technical issues, it's more important than ever before to have uh, folks who can do this kind of work and it's really, it's a pleasure to have you. So there's Zebulon Schmidt is here, Prince Sprov and James Peterson. Uh, big thank you to them and thank you to Proctors for this space. Um, so thanks again for everybody and looks like we're gonna get out of here on time. So have a good night.